What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is September 16th of 2019. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are. And in today's video, I wanna spend some time to focus on the macro topic that happened just a few days ago. And that was the recent drone attack in Saudi Arabia on a major oil production facility. Now, we're not only gonna be talking a little bit more in the sense of the details of what happened to try to get a better understanding, I'm can guarantee I probably won't be able to give you the full scoop of everything, but to get a brief understanding and then outside of that as well, talk about a variety of different interesting things, interesting trends that we saw in equity markets beforehand, whether or not this is going to have a substantial actual increase on oil prices in the long term and really build into a point that I've tried to make very clear over the last year or so, which is that OPEC and oil producing nations are losing their edge. Okay. So we've got a lot of things to discuss, guys, but also towards the end of the video, we have got a review of the Baidao platform, which is aiming to provide not only stable coins, but also decentralized and trustless margin lending. So we'll talk about that later on in the video. Hope you guys will stick around for it. It's going to be a really interesting one. But anyways, let's go ahead and talk about what happened here. Well, I think the first thing to look at here that's always just kind of an eye catcher, and then also at the same time important in the sense of seeing how it's actually had a materialized effect is the price action. So as we mentioned, there was a drone attack in Saudi Arabia, and we'll take a look at some of the articles here that talk about it, a little bit about the details. But this led oil prices to spiking up to the biggest one-day divergence open that we've seen, I know at least in the last few years, but some people are saying in the sense of the history of crude oil. So we haven't seen this kind of shock come to markets ever in history, according to a lot of sources. So that's pretty you know, significant to take into mind. And a lot of people are curious now, you know, for example, as we take a look at the trading day here, I mean, we've only been trading the futures here for a few hours. If you take a look at some of the other futures contracts, they've been trading a little bit longer. But the question here is whether or not this is going to have a lasting impact. Is this going to lead towards a multi-day rally where oil prices go higher towards, you know, $70 a barrel, $80? Are we really going to see a significant rise here? Uh, you know, we already leapt up around $6 here or near around 10%. And during the earlier trading hours, around 15 to 18%, right? Well, I'm going to really lead to a point throughout this video that I don't think it's going to lead to much significant increases. Uh, a lot of the numbers have been overstated. Uh, Saudi Arabia has made it confirmed and clear that in the next few days or next few weeks that they're going to be able to get back to full capacity, uh, whether it be either shipping current reserves that they have or if they're going to be you know, again, reinstating production, getting back into the game as they normally would. So I don't think there's much significant fears there in the short term. But again, we can see here that this has had a pretty big impact here on oil markets here in the short term. Taking in perspective though, we're really back to where prices were back here on July 12th. So this isn't a major shock to the global economy. I mean, even as some countries are teetering towards recession territory, crude was much higher back here in September of 2018. And again, back here in April. Crude was higher, right? It's we're really not that far off from those highs. We've been basically going sideways, if not towards a slight decline in oil markets overall, because we've been setting lower highs every single time, right? So I, I'm not really worried about that in that case. I, I don't I don't think this is going to lead to a spike. You know, some people are talking about you know it could go to a hundred dollars a barrel. I don't think so. All right, so I'm kind of rambling here. Let's go ahead and get a little bit to the story here. So again. Biggest jump on record, what happened? So we had a drone strike in Saudi Arabia that is basically removing about 5% of global supply. So this is coming at a time where oil markets over the last few years have seen a huge glut due to new technologies like fracking that have made it cheaper even in Western countries. In this case, that have made it practical to drill in the United States and uh, as well as a lot of other countries just not coming together, OPEC losing its power, oil, uh, oil production in both the United States, Russia, and a variety of other countries bolstering to new highs. We're now seeing a glutton supply in the economy. So when something like this comes, this kind of shock, this sudden response, where it's not companies or countries deciding that they're going to cut when 5% just instantly is cut off the supply chain, which again is running at a daily basis and is very hard to reinstate and also to cut back. Um, in this case, is a pretty decent shock. That's why we got the price jump that we did. Right? Now, 
in the sense of understanding what caused this, right? There's a really good BBC article here that I think covers a good gist of it that at least kind of shows different perspectives. It showcases, for example, uh, the general consensus right now of who did the drone strike, right? Again, I know a lot of people, and this is where you get into uh, uh, different opinions in the sense of geopolitics and also, and fair enough, conspiracy sometimes. There's a lot of big money in the business of oil. Um, and then also, you know, the price of oil going up, the financial markets that trade around it. So I wouldn't discount conspiracies, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on, just in the sense of who has to benefit. So the idea here is that Iran is responsible and that this is coming from a, a certain rebel group. I want to make sure I always get the um, a, a Yemeni, yeah, the, uh, it was the Yemeni Houthi rebel uh, group, which is basically has taken full responsibility for this from my understanding. And basically they deployed around 10 drones in the attacks specifically targeted to create a shock to Saudi Arabia to attack its oil supply directly. And these are, and my under, from my understanding, whether they're you know manned drones, whatever, there is obviously no humans. They're just basically drones that their sole purpose was to destroy these oil facilities or at least postpone any future production. So this is seen uh, by the United States, by most world governments that have commented on the issue as a direct attack on the energy supply chain. What concerns me the most is that, uh, you know, from taking a look at tweets like uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo and a lot of other major leaders, uh, this is concerning to me in the sense that this is going to lead towards some form of military action. Now, at the, the end of the day, guys, I'll be fair with you all, I, I don't like seeing people who are peacefully producing goods and services being attacked. Uh, I don't care if Saudi Arabia is the best country in the world or not. I don't want to see that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that's the job of the United States to get involved. Uh, I don't think Joe Schmo, who's working for 15 to $20 an hour in a factory that's on the opposite end of the world from Saudi Arabia, who's already trying to struggle to get by and paying for his health care expenditures, his kid's college, his own well-being, living expenses i don't think he has to fuel another war or he has to fuel uh, another military intervention where the united states has to be the police of saudi arabia and protecting their oil production i believe what in this case would be best is that saudi arabia make the necessary investments to either a beef up its military to defend its country from these kind of attacks or b the oil manufacturers themselves hire private contractors to protect against things like this right I feel really bad that this happened. I mean, no matter who caused it, it, it sucks because now a bunch of oil is wasted. A lot of uh, emissions have now gone into the atmosphere, and it's it's a net negative, right? But there are some people who can benefit from it. So anyways, again, you guys can read a little bit more about these specific attacks, learning a little bit about the rebel group. They do actually talk about that later on here in the article, talking about the Houthis. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, but you guys can probably assume that I'm not. <laughs> But they actually do link to some really good sources here just to kind of learn a little bit about it. But again, get it from different news sources. Don't just take it from here. This is just an article that I found summarizes it in a decent degree. And guys, trust me, compared to news journalists here in the United States, BBC is actually pretty all right. <laughs> so anyways, this does bring up an interesting topic as well we have to discuss. Uh, and I won't spend the whole video talking about it, but the question of how we're going to combat the drone revolution that's going to be coming. I mean, this is something that's been sensationalized by Hollywood and video games, but it's kind of true. What happens when you get extremely uh, fast, lethal, unmanned drones that uh, can do things like this? What's to stop them from, uh, you know, causing some kind of attack on civilians or, you know, whatever it may be? This is a really kind of concerning thing to think about. We're going to have to find ways to counter this in the future. If a, a group of rebels can do this to an oil facility, uh, who's to say other people can't? Uh, that's a very scary thought. So uh, again, I would love to know what you guys think about you know countering this in some sense. It's a very interesting topic. Now I want to spend a little bit of time now to talk about what happened at energy markets over the last few weeks. And what's interesting enough, now I, I want to be fair here and neutral, 
in the sense of this view, but it's keeping up into the idea that some people happen to know about this before it happened. If you take a look at energy markets here, uh, we had a really good week here, uh, go, seeing XLE, which is a common energy ETF, going from around $56 all the way up to around the, up, the lower $60 range, which is a nice leap here for one week of energy prices retracing on a lot of these losses. Now, a lot of people noticed that as this happened, crude prices, for example, right, didn't really move much. Right? We really pushed sideways here. And some people not only noticed the sense of price action, but uh, Alistair, who's an individual I follow over on Twitter, posted this really interesting chart that is a, an interesting graph that factors in for improving and leading, as well as weakening, and then also, I think, uh, lagging in this case. So basically, it's comparing the energy sector here that's checked off comparative to the S&P 500 index. We see this huge reversal coming out on energy markets interestingly enough before the attacks now i think that that is an interesting point to make and it's why i mentioned it here in this video because guys there is money to be made there's money to be made betting on the overall crude spot price right and there's also benefit to be made owning energy stocks when this stuff happens it's the world we live in it's finance it's supply and demand you can't deny it it, it plays a role right um, there is one thing to take into mind here and that is that energy prices are not only determined by crude markets, but they're also determined by nat gas markets, natural gas, right? And I will say, natural gas might be the explanation here, uh, because if I take a look at some of the energy pro the energy performers that have done really well, uh, I see that in a lot of the natural gas producers, right? I know one, for example, is Chesapeake, right? Chesapeake Energy Corp. This one picked up from 130, let's say, actually get the low here, around 133 all the way up to 212 in a matter of about two weeks of trading. All right, this has been really been following correlation with natural gases increase. So it could be that that explains it, right? It could be that no one really knew about this outside of the terrorists who committed the act, right? But again, I think the, the opportunity still stands and stuff. Again, guys, there's, you know, th this speaks to a larger issue that I'm going to really be focusing on here. And that is the question of whether or not um, OPEC has control over energy markets anymore. And guys, look, you can have different opinions. Uh, OPEC does produce a lot of the oil in the world as a conjunction of nations as an organization. But I'm going to be honest with you guys. There's not much room for debate. They're losing their grounds very severely. And there's a lot of evidence to back this up. So the first one here is that in the United States, we'll use the U.S. as an example in this, but there's other countries as well. Russia, major oil producing countries across the world, they're finding ways to produce cheaper like they could in OPEC nations. Um, and with that, they're continuing production even in this environment where oil prices have not been in a major uptrend. They've been in a longer term downtrend. So first, for example, in America, where it is probably one of the more expensive countries to produce Oil and natural gas? Well, America's oil and gas reserves have just doubled with a massive new Permian discovery. So this is down in Texas. This is where we found a lot of our oil reserves in the United States. We've basically, and again, uh, in this case, doubled, more than doubled actually, our available oil reserves. So this is really the article right here. The USGS, major organization to determine uh, gas reserves in the United States, the, United States, the, the USGS estimates that over 46 billion barrels of oil, 280 trillion cubic feet of gas, and 20 billion barrels of natural gas liquids are trapped in these lower permeability shale formations. So to better understand how staggering this is, we have now more than doubled our available oil supply. Right? We had 20 billion barrels before, and now there's over 46 billion barrels. We have more than doubled it. And then also in the sense of natural gas, huge increase in reserves as well. Not as much as crude here, but still a very big increase. Again, so we're basically seeing more than 100% increase in crude supply in the United States and 65% increase in natural gas reserves. Now, the question here is whether or not it's it, all of it's going to be cost effective. I would actually deduct some of it because some of it is not cost effective right now. But with technologies like fracking, we can reach a lot of these different types of basins and actually be able to extract these different types of commodities. And outside of that as well, oh, sorry, there's a little ad here. <laughs> I don't know what that was about basis. Another point here to take into mind as well 
is that U.S. oil exports doubled, nearly doubled in 2018. And we are continuing to produce at a very steady pace as we've been able to produce much cheaper. Take a look at this chart here. The EIA, the Energy Information Administration, has a beautiful chart here to show that the United States is no longer going to be a major importer alone. We're also exporting. And this is a really interesting shift for energy markets because for nearly decades, we have been so interdependent on OPEC and major oil producing countries for input or imports of cheap oil. It's played a huge role in the petrodollar. And now finally, we're getting to a point where we've got a lot of reserves and we can be energy independent. And I think for those who think of the macro trend, right, who think of the longer term here, we are not only going to be energy independent over the next decade in the sense of our oil and natural gas demands, but along with that, we're going to get to a point where, again, where we're already starting this, where we're seeing a decline from fossil fuels. We're seeing more people move to electric vehicles. We're seeing more push for renewable energy. Again, you have to consider the curve, the decline in cost for things like solar, like wind technology. And again, I do believe a big equation that's going to be nuclear. It's not talked about at all, but I would love to see nuclear become a part of that equation. And all of those are going to cut a huge production or sorry, not production, it's going to cut a huge demand on oil and natural gas. Even if the reserves are out there, even if it's dirt cheap, even if we find a way to reduce the cost by a third or half or whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. And this is going to lead, in my opinion, from what I'm able to estimate here in the sense of the chart, it's going to lead crude oil to go down back into its multi multi-decade channel between around 18 to forty dollars here right and of course we have some anomalies here where it breaks out of this channel but generally speaking i think it's going to hang around this range where it's going to hang around twenty dollars a barrel and considering inflation that is dirt cheap it's no longer uh, i would say liquid gold by any means oil is not in the uptrend it was during the early 2000s the commodity boom at least for industrial commodities like crude oil and natural gas I think is over but I'd like to know what you all think about it I know I've rambled on I've probably talked enough oil today for you guys to handle but um anyways I hope you all appreciated the video if you did drop a like leave a comment let me know what your thoughts are you know what do you make of this do you think this is going to have an impact on oil prices do you think we're going back to a hundred dollars a barrel or do you see this as a non-event kind of like I do and uh, that this is going to eventually pass in time and that prices will continue to reduce as supply fills in, I'd like to know what you all think. Anyways, let's go ahead and dive into our review of Baidao. Alrighty, everyone. So let's go ahead and spend some time to take a look at today's sponsor, and it is no other than Baidao. Now, many of you out there might have heard me mention about the DeFi or decentralized finance movement. And if you have found as much interest in it as I have, you're probably going to like what's going on with the team at Baidao. So what is Baidao simply? Well, it's aiming to solve two key solutions. It's trying to provide a censorship resistant stable coin that will be accessible to anyone across the world. And along with that as well, it's trying to provide a solution for margin traders to be able to get instant access to leverage on top of your current existing capital by using your underlying crypto as collateral. And this is something that we've seen before. We've seen this attempted by previous projects like MakerDAO. But the thing about Baidao is that it's cutting out the restriction from being locked into the Ethereum network. And in fact, is experimenting with other protocols like Binance Chain and using BNB as collateral and hopes one day to be the overall arching solution for people to get access to decentralized and censorship resistant capital for margin trading and margin lending in this case. So that we could use a variety of protocols and use a variety of forms of collateral in order to generate this available margin to gain more exposure to cryptocurrencies. So I know I rambled on a little bit, but that's the key thing to take away here. But we're going to go ahead and dive into a few things here. So as I hinted to, as in this case, buy now is aiming to provide a stable coin that's pegged to the US dollar in this case. So in this case, if you use buy their stable coin, as we'll talk about, it's BAI, you'll be able to have something that resembles a dollar. 
And we'll talk about how you generate this. You generate this through using BNB as collateral. Now again, in the future, it's important to note that BuyDAO is going to have a variety of different forms of collateral, much like in MakerDAO, how you use Ethereum to generate a CDP or collateralized debt position. You'll be able to use BNB here on BuyDAO, hence the name BuyDAO, Binance, and then Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So in this case, you'll be able to use BNB originally, which is, again, one of the more prominent cryptocurrencies and is fostered within the Binance chain and Binance ecosystem. So again, you've got a lot of projects coming onto Binance chain as of recent, and Binance is a pretty large respected entity in the crypto space. And outside of that as well, you can stake your BuyDAO tokens. So as you stake your BuyDAO tokens, you'll be able to earn passive income in this case, as again, as the new uh, stable coins are generated in this case from collateral in this case, you're going to be basically earning a sense of passive income or interest in this case. So we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go and I'll even show you guys real time in their very clean and simple wallet how easy it is to start staking. Once your bid tokens are in your wallet, you instantly start getting paid out on a daily basis. And we'll take a look at that in just a little bit. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into probably the best part of any project, even though to many it might seem overcomplicating in some cases, is the white paper. Well, I got to say their white paper is pretty clean, actually, guys. It's only about 19 pages in total. And we're going to go ahead through some of the major sections here so you guys get a good idea about what Baidao is doing. So what is Baidao? Well, Baidao is a new blockchain system that actually isn't built specifically on any uh, key blockchain. It's actually, again, blockchain agnostic in the case that they're going to be expanding to a lot of different blockchains, but it aims to serve as a key solution for the DeFi movement. And as we discussed, this is to provide censorship resistant dollars that's available to anyone across the world who can download a mobile or desktop wallet to access this tool. And then outside of that as well, to be able to provide a solution for decentralized uh, margin trading. All right. So again, both very big markets here, stablecoin market as they hinted to on the, uh, the Bidale website is about $4 billion right now. And I have no doubt that it's gonna to continue to grow. In the long term, I really do believe that until Bitcoin and Ethereum become less volatile, people are going to be using stable coins. So solutions like Bido are very key. Now, outside of this, well, uh, they are doing a crowdfunding to just share it with you guys if you guys would like to consider checking into Bidale. Again, uh, you guys can go to the link down below, and I think they have uh, a way to invest in it without KYC for up to like $10,000, so it's pretty cool. Uh, but again, check into it, do your own due diligence if you guys are interested in this. And I want to mention as well, there's a few other key components here. Outside of the fact that they're using BNB as collateral, we kind of need to understand the token architecture here, okay? So there's three tokens uh, to consider here, right? So we've already talked about BNB, which is gonna be the collateral in this case, in order to get new buy tokens in this case. So it's 100% collateralized in this case, meaning that you're going to need an equal amount of collateral for what you wanna generate, right? And if you, for, for example, in this case, actually you're gonna need more collateral in this case, I misspoke on that, you're gonna need more collateral in this case in order to generate buy tokens. But here's the thing. The way that it works is that if you, for example, let's say I had $100 worth of BNB tokens, this is my collateral, and I have 50 buy tokens I can generate from that, that would be a collateralization ratio of two to one in this case. I need two times the amount of collateral in order to generate the stable coin. But with this stable coin, I can go out and actually buy more BNB. I could buy exposure to other cryptos that I think will outpace the dollar. This is where the margin trading comes in. But just like margin trading, where there are margin calls, there are liquidations, if I happen to make a wrong call in this case, where I'm using my BNB as collateral and I generated the stable coin, if my BNB goes down 50%, it's now getting to a point where there has to be a margin call. There needs to be a liquidation. And just like how on a you know, centralized exchange that can happen, this can also happen when you're generating buy the stable coin with your BNB. Now again, as we talked about, BID is the staking and governance coin, okay? So again, if you're wanting to just again earn passive income in this case, you don't want to think too much, and you really just want to again earn passive income, earn that interest on top of the capital in order to, the, the cost in this case to generate buy, then in this case, the BID token is for you. And that's what they're doing the crowdfunding for at the moment. So again, that's the importance here. The difference between BID and buy is that buy is the stable coin that's generated on top of BNB, and the bid token is the staking governance token where you can earn passive income and you could also as well have a sense of governance and voting within the uh, buy ecosystem. So again, very important to take into mind here. 
Now for those of you wondering how Bi keeps its stability, which is an important question, it uses a very prominent and key solution that Dai already uses, which is the stability fee. Now the stability mechanism or the stability fee is a certain way where you can incentivize people in order to keep the value at a dollar, right? This has been utilized for a while. It keeps Dai pretty damn close to the dollar outside of a few fluctuations in the past. And I think it's going to work just as equally fine here for buy in this case. So we have generally three cases here, right? The market value of buy equals one USD. That's the desired case scenario. But sometimes markets have inefficiencies. Sometimes buy might go above the dollar. Sometimes it might go below the dollar. How do you incentivize people to keep it towards that one dollar valuation? Well, they actually have a really good chart here that demonstrates this, all right? So there's a certain fee you have to pay in order to generate new buy in this case, or to actually close out of your CDP position. And this is exactly what happens on DAI. And there's really uh, two ways that the fee can go. They can increase the stability fee, basically in this case, making it more expensive to close out of your position or create new positions, right? So if one buy is less than a dollar, then it's going to again reduce the supply here, right? If the value of it is down below, we want to cut the production of new buy so that the supply and demand changes in this case to bring it back to a dollar and vice versa. If one buy is over a dollar, this is breaking our trend of wanting it to be pegged to the dollar, then we're going to decrease the cost of the stability fee, making it easier for more people to generate new buy in this case, more stable coins. So hopefully that makes sense. Right, And again, this has been used on DAI for a long time. If you guys want to learn a little bit more, you guys can study into the white paper, read into the technical aspects of it. But again, the other factor here to take into account is that every 12 hours here for the bid token, you are going to receive the interest in this case, or the fees in this case charged on top of generating the new buy tokens. Okay. So that's how it works. And again, if you want to read into the governance, if you're really interested into the governance protocol, they have a little bit of stuff here in the white paper as well, some diagrams talking about voting, increasing uh, you know, the different types of features that could be on the buyout chain, in this case of being able to implement new proposals, things of that sort. Now, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the team because I think that's very important. And with most of the projects that I look through here to do sponsors on the channel, I always try to make sure that their team looks good. And it seems like they've got two very young, ambitious individuals who are heading up the team, as well as some other individuals as well, who, again, you should do your due diligence on, check into. We've got Bastian and Brian here. Now, they're pretty interesting individuals that I think are important to take into account. We've got, for example, Brian here who has not only founded previous startups, you can tell both of them, like myself, are young, and I appreciate that about them. Uh, but Brian here, for example, was a founder of previous startups, and he's got a pretty big following himself on Twitter and a lot of other social media. You can watch his TED Talk, which we'll leave a link down below, where he talks about the potential behind blockchain technology. And it's pretty cool. I think he's a, he's a very knowledgeable individual about what he spoke about. I like the points that he made in his TED Talk. And again, you guys are welcome to check it out down below if you'd like to learn a little bit more about him. But not only do we have previous individuals who have founded companies, we also have, for example, Bastian here, who also as well is an Apple Scholar. Now, an Apple Scholar, to kind of put it simple, it's a competition that Apple holds, and uh, you know, there's only a few winners each and every year that win this Apple Scholarship program. But he actually won it three times in the past. So he's pretty knowledgeable himself. Again, you guys can watch this video. It's a very short one that just kind of talks about what Baidao is, and again, I recommend watching both videos. It's good to know who the founders are of a project. And not to mention as well, they've got different individuals who are heading up marketing. We've got Caroline Kerpiers here, as well as Zhao Long Zhang, who is heading up the head of Asia here. And the one thing I think that's important as well is that they've actually got legal expert support right from the get-go. Now, if you guys click on the real legal document here, which you can read, uh, you're gonna have to probably use a browser that can translate. I'm just currently on Brave browser, but I think on Chrome, they have a translator that you can instantly just highlight the text, translate, and you guys can read it for yourself. But they're based in the EU, so this makes sense, right? They're a, mostly a German-based team here. Now again, the major thing that I think will interest a lot of people here is the staking mechanism. And again, you guys can learn about how you can become a power staker in this case. And the earlier you start staking, you actually earn a higher rate of interest, in this case, a higher yield. So let's go ahead and actually showcase the Baidao wallet and get a feel for the user experience, as well as how simple it is to just simply start staking for those of you who may be interested in the staking mechanism. 
So as we can see here, this is the BuyDAO wallet. Once you've registered an account as well as downloaded your wallet client, you can go ahead and download the BuyDAO wallet and open it up, log into your account, and this is what you're gonna see. It's actually quite simple. Now what we have here is $10,000 worth of BuyDAO, and in this case to start showcasing the interest earning mechanism. We can see that right now at the current yield of 50% staking power on an annual basis, you're earning around $14.08 a day with $10,000 worth of buy down, right? And we can see here as well, very similar to Ethereum wallets. I know many of you out there possibly haven't used any Binance wallets yet because Binance is really starting to come up as of recent. Seeing as BuyDAO is based around the Binance chain and its token is based on the Binance chain, this is what it looks like to send between different addresses. We can have our unique BuyDAO address here. It starts with a BID and you've got a random hash of different letters and numbers. And this is your account at the moment, at least our wallet here. And we can actually send money to another BuyDAO address. So if I wanted to send BuyDAO, or if I wanted to send, for example, the other types of tokens that there are, like Buy, if I wanted to send that stablecoin, I could do that. And outside of that as well, uh, you can also send it as well. You can send the amount in this case. And again, at the moment, it's deactivated during the fundraising. But again, I think this is really cool. Like, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than this, especially during the early days where most people are just wanting to stake. Again, I think it's very clean. And the nice thing about it is that on the staking side, it's important to note, you don't have to worry about determining who can get loans on the margin side, who can use BNB as collateral, because the whole gist of it, guys, is that in this case, they're using BNB, they're using their own collateral in order to protect the loan. So it's completely collateralized, right? They lose their underlying capital if they don't pay out. And the thing about it is that the only thing you should be concerned about is that you're getting the stability fee, right? That's in order to keep the price around $1. And that's what you get for staking the buy down token, right? So this is really how it all works. And there's no need to overcomplicate it. It's pretty simple. And again, in the future, they hope that you'll be able to you know, send buy down, send buy, and all these different tokens across one another. And that hopefully over time as well, they'll have some more functionality on the wallet. It'll expand out a little bit more. But again, right now, it's pretty clean. I gotta say, this is probably what 90% of users are gonna need right off the bat when it comes to the buy down token, is earning the staking mechanism. And in the future, I'm assuming they're gonna really expand on like being able to vote on proposals and governance policies, things of that sort. So let's go ahead and kind of summarize things here, guys. We've taken a good look at what buy down is all about. We understand that it's trying to be an improvement on previous existing solutions and the sense of expanding decentralized and open access margin trading services, as well as providing a stable coin of some sort that doesn't rely that there's a dollar in some vault somewhere in some kind of bank under a centralized entity. No, you know that on the blockchain that buy can only be created with BNB or other forms of decentralized trustless collateral on these blockchain protocols. So that's a really cool thing about it. It speaks to a lot of what I personally care about. It's a solution for the DeFi movement. It brings open access to the dollar to the world stage through the buy stable coin. And it provides an easy way for those of you out there who really love proof of stake to be able to earn interest, right? So it does a lot of great things. It checks off a lot of boxes and opens up opportunities for a lot of people in the crypto space. That being said, the only kind of criticism I can think of here or concerns that I have, as I always want to be non-biased, is that early on, BNB might be a little bit of a volatile asset to be used as collateral. This is commonly brought up for Ethereum in this case, so that the only occurrence that you might have uh, you know, using a buy down in this case in order to generate the buy stable coin and using BNB as collateral is that sometimes you might have to refinance or you basically will have to continue putting in BNB in order to uh, cover or collateralize the stable coins you've generated. This happens a lot on MakerDAO and DAI, so I don't really see it as much of a concern. If you're gonna be generating it, I think this early on, you probably understand the risk of it as a margin trader or someone who just wants to generate stable coins, right? So again, they will allow you to do that. That's a feature you can do. You can always refinance and in that case, put more collateral as the value might decline over time in BNB. But it's a way where you can still hold your underlying collateral, your investments in this case, and you can also gain extra exposure on the market. So it functions as intended. And again, doesn't rely that you trust in some centralized exchange or centralized entity. I think it's right down the alley of what I like, and I hope it's down the alley of what you guys like, but I'd like to know down in the comments down below. But again, if you're interested in anything, there's tons of links down below so you guys can do your own due diligence, do your own research, and learn about what Baidao is doing compared to the other competition to shake up the DeFi space. Anyways, that's it for the video, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.